right. Well, then cat's already out of the bag. Yeah. What now? Well, I think we're going to have to do some hard-nosed negotiation with the Iranians, with the North Koreans, uh, to make sure that they don't uh, proliferate, uh, you know, their, their bomb-making capabilities. But I think we have to realize that smaller nations, and eventually terrorists, eventually small nation states uh, that are working with terrorists, may get access to this, some of this technology. That's, that's really frightening. Take a look at Russia. You have uh, weapons-grade fuel just lying on the floor sometimes. Uh, in Russia. Um, no one really knows how much uranium uh, enriched fuel was processed in Russia because the, the commissars used to always overproduce weapons grade uranium uh, and meet the quotas and then of course during a rainy day they can take this extra fuel out of the closet and and make make their quota, right? Sure. Well no one knows how much uranium fuel is in the closet. There are no accountings for this. Uh, because the commissars were very careful in, you know, squirreling away uranium fuel for a rainy day. Well, that rainy day never came. The Soviet Union broke apart, and who knows how much uranium, that, uh, enriched uranium the, the Russians really have. They don't, they themselves don't really know. And that's frightening. When, when I talked to some bomb scientists who went to Russia, and they told me that they were shaken when they realized that even the Russians don't know how much uranium fuel is floating around. <laughs> So, you know, this is the price we paid for going into the peaceful atom. You know, um, after a lecture like this, I'm tempted to ask you about your old scales. Remember type 0, type 1, mm -hmm. type 2, type 3? That's right. right? Uh, I mean, it's a little depressing listening to what you, you just said, if you fully grasp it. Um, and it would seem to me that if I were to ask you now, our chances of making it to, what is it, a full, full type 1? Type 1. Yeah, type 1. Uh, our chances have got to be really bad. Well, we are embarking, as, as I mentioned before on this show, uh, the, the greatest transition in all of human history, the transition from type 0 to type 1. And it's taken, you know, us, us humans 100,000 years, ever since modern humans emerged, to reach the stage of being on the threshold of type 1. And we could blow it. We could easily blow it because of designer germs, because of uh, designer nuclear weapons, and uh, because of the designer chemicals. Well, how optimistic are you, or pessimistic, really, cutting to the chase? Well, you know, at the height of the Cold War, it was really frightening at the height of the Cold War. You have to put things into perspective. Uh, you know, there were war plans uh, on both sides for preemptive strike. Um, um, the uh, the uh, United States, um, arch the archives of the national... Well, many of these war plans are not declassified. Well, all right. And okay. if you look at them, they're very frightening. They're first strike right. war plans. Let's actually talk about that. I I'd like to talk about first strike when we get back. What a program. Professor Michio Kaku is my guest, and if it gets any better than this with talk radio, I certainly don't know how. From the high desert in the middle of the night, this is Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. I am Art Bell. Well, actually, for George tonight, he'll be back tomorrow night. And Dr. Michio Kaku is my guest, and this is absolutely riveting stuff. First strike, huh? Do you believe in miracles? Well, we got through the Cold War without either side resorting to a first strike. That's almost a miracle, isn't it? It's clearly the unthinkable. The, the, really, it clearly is the unthinkable. But both sides apparently had um, first strike uh, plans drawn up on the table during all those terrible years that I lived through. I got under my desk at school and put my hands over my back of my neck. I knew how to protect from an A-bomb, my God. <laughs> Just kidding. But I did do that. They did have us do it. Do you remember that campaign, uh, Professor? That's right. And uh, now that it's uh, been so many decades after those horrible years, a lot of this information is being declassified, both from Russia and the United States. What do we know? And we know that we came awfully close. Uh, they were hotheads uh, arguing for preemptive strike. Uh, we know that in 1948, as early as then, during the Berlin crisis, uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Forrestal, was arguing for a first strike to execute Operation Boiler 
Operation Broiler was the plan for a preemptive nuclear first strike on Russia in 1948 with a fleet of old bombers uh, dropping what is called the Mark III atomic bomb on Russia. Well, what would we have done? Would we have hit uh, military targets, obviously, and uh, beyond that, were, were there plans to hit civilian targets? Uh, well, the plans listed cities. Um, in fact, again, if you go to the National Archives, you can get these plans. Uh, uh, the, in the 50s, the most elaborate plan was called Operation Off Tackle. Um, all the cities were listed, and um, it, it basically says that within six hours, uh, the, the Soviet Union would cease to exist as a functioning nation. All the major cities would be obliterated. And in 1954, uh, there were hotheads within the Joint Chiefs arguing for a preemptive strike. And of course, during the Kennedy administration, uh, people were shocked when they found out that at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were hotheads again arguing for a preemptive first strike. I wonder how close to getting their ideas accepted they got. Well, we know from the transcripts now that have been gradually leaked out of the Cuban Missile Crisis that uh, Kennedy put his foot down and overruled uh, some of the hotheads in his own administration who were saying that, you know, it's either now or never. Finally, the moment of truth has come. Uh -huh. um, Eisenhower had to deal with the same thing in 1954. Um, the... Um, there was a subcommittee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff arguing for a preemptive first strike on Russia in 1954. All right, wouldn't all these plans, Professor, um, have the likelihood of, of the outcome, uh, knowing how many million would be dead, how long the geography would be unlivable, um, and then, of course, uh, there would be a certain amount of retaliation without question. They'd have launched against us or launched whatever they could have, did these plans include the possibility of so much success that they literally wouldn't be able to launch back against us? Well, uh, and again, Russia probably also had similar plans. Who knows for sure? I'm sure. But uh, the point you raise is that, uh, yes, uh, in 54, when Eisenhower was presented the option of, of initiating Operation Off Tackle, um, they estimated that 735 bombers hitting the radar screens simultaneously at the, on the Soviet Union's radar screens, right. that in six hours they would have total victory, uh, that the Russians may be able to get maybe one bison or a few bear bombers off the ground and cause some havoc maybe in Europe, but they wouldn't be able to hit the United States. But they argued that after 54, uh, the bison and bear bombers would be able to hit the United States. And the window, the window would close after 1954. Were they right? Well, what happened was Eisenhower, very interestingly enough, um, organized a study group called the Solarium to investigate whether or not these, 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 this, this talk of the hotheads was correct or not. Right. And the conclusion was, believe it or not, uh, there was no Star Wars in 1954. Right. There was no way to shoot down the bison or bear bomber. Right. As the report uh, mentioned, uh, even Cuban biplanes <laughs> could could reach Florida. Um, so, in other words, all these plans had assumed that the Russians could not retaliate. But after 54, uh, they had the bison and bear, and they could hit the United States. And so that window was rapidly closing. And after 54, the window closed. Uh, it does. It, it meant that we were now two scorpions in a bottle. Mm -hmm. You strike me, I strike you, and we both die in the bottle. Yes. But before '54, uh, it was basically, you know, the, the United States option of nuclear first strike. So, uh, so they, again, were, they were right. After '54, the window closed. I, I've got that. But prior to that, they were right. They could have, at that point, struck. Well, that's what the hotheads in the Eisenhower administration were arguing.